we're gathered here on a day called Good Friday, which seems a little sarcastic. Because the Friday that Jesus died didn't look good to anybody who was in it. So I'm calling it Black Friday. They could call it Good Friday. The Friday after Thanksgiving. We'll just trade. The culmination of Jesus' ministry when he finally came to the earth was for him to die. And yet the way that it happened was so dastardly and it was so wicked that no one has ever suffered like this. He was rejected by everyone, even his closest disciples. And as often as Jesus tried to explain to them what was happening, they didn't get it. They never understood him. I don't know if you've ever tried to explain yourself and not be understood, but that's a very frustrating thing, especially when you say it multiple times. And it's a truth above all truth. And that's what Jesus went through. Leading up to his death, his crucifixion on the cross, it's a whole long and involved, complicated story of what happened. I've decided to go through the book of Mark. I've never gone through the book of Mark during this week. I've, I've gathered all of the information from all the gospels and put an entire timeline together. And I've gone through John, I've gone through Luke, and I've gone through Matthew, but I've never gone through Mark. It's the most abbreviated of them. But he brings out some interesting things and some things that we don't find in the other gospels as well. In chapter 14, leading up to his crucifixion, there was the plot to kill Jesus. The religious rulers saw him as a threat. Everything that he did, everyone that he touched was changed except for them. They were interested in power. They were interested in control. They were the pol political maneuverers of their time. And they had long since departed from having a relationship with Yahweh and they plotted to murder him. Plotting to murder somebody is not found anywhere in the scriptures. And yet they plotted to murder Jesus. He goes to the house of a friend. It's interesting, his name is Simon the leper. But he's not a leper anymore. It, it's kind of like calling somebody a biker when they're not a biker anymore or something else, but they call him Simon the leper. They're at his house in Bethany, and there's a woman, it says, that comes in. The book of Mark says a woman, but we find out from the book of John who it really is. It's Mary of the Mary and Martha and Lazarus household. And she comes in with a bottle of very expensive ointment and begins to anoint Jesus. And the disciples make a problem with that. And actually, John tells us it's not the disciples so much as it is Judas Iscariot. And he says, why is this woman wasting all of this precious ointment? It could have been sold for 10,000 talents and, and, and feed the poor. And it's not that he cared about the poor. It's that he cared about money. And it was that event that he so despised Jesus that he turned around and left and he went to the political rulers and said, what do you want for me to betray him? And he sets him up because of this event. He could not handle the lavish worship that Jesus received from this woman. And he said, let the woman alone. She's doing this in preparing of my death. Apparently Mary, who is always at the feet of Jesus, she understood what was going to happen, and no one else did. So she anoints him with this oil as preparing his body for ultimate burial. And Judas runs out to go and betray him in this house of a friend. In verses 10 and 11, we see Judas running away and collecting the deal. 
He's going to make some money off of this. And we see that because he was so jealous of the worship Jesus received, he left. Sounds very familiar. It's very much what happened to Satan when he fell. He said, I will be like the most high God. I will be on these, these high places of the north. I will receive the recognition and the glory. And so he follows in the paths of the one whom he follows. And he asks for a sum of money. And he looks for a convenient moment to betray Jesus. Jesus then has what you know is the Passover meal or the Last Supper, where he gathers his disciples and he says, with great joy, I've looked forward to having this meal with you. And he begins to tell them of all the things that's going to happen. And the longest uh, passage about this is in the book of John. And Jesus shares his heart about everything that's going to go on. And he begins to go around and he washes their feet. And of course, he gets to Peter and Peter wants nothing to do with that. And he says, well, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part with me, Peter. And he says, well, then wash my head and my hands also. Uh, Peter always going way over. And so Jesus said, you don't need your hands and your head washed. You just need your feet washed because you are all clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Very interesting, the spiritual lesson in the midst of this practical action. And he says, one of you is going to betray me. And they all immediately say, no, not me, Lord, not me. And then it begins to change into, is it me? Oh, Lord, is it me? Is it me, the Lord? Is that and he says, one of you is going to betray me tonight. And Peter gets up with this big, powerful man. He says, I will never deny you. And he says, that's funny, Peter, because by the time that the crow crows or the rooster crows three times, you will deny me twice. And that kind of stops all the boasting. So Jesus is preparing them and he's announced somebody's going to betray him and it looks like it's Peter. But it's really Judas who leaves. And he tells him with the bite of the bread, go and do what you must do quickly. As Jesus is telling the story, he uncovers Peter. And they all leave and they go to Gethsemane. It says that they sung a hymn. It's not a hymn that you've ever heard on an organ. It's a hymn that they would sing without any instrumentation. And they sung as they went down into the Kidron Valley and they went over that little stream, that little brook that by this time was flowing with blood from the sacrificial lambs. And they go over into Gethsemane, which is a place of pressing, that's what it means. And it's in a, an olive grove with olive trees and they would press the olives there. And it's interesting because Jesus was then pressed in that place. He walks a couple steps away from the three main disciples and they're a few steps away from the rest of them. And he says, please stay awake and pray with me because I am weary unto death you would figure the language would be such that they would pay attention. But they fall asleep. They're tired from arguing. They're tired from grieving that Jesus said, somebody's going to turn me in. Somebody's going to betray me. So they fall asleep and Jesus prays, Father, if this cup can pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. And he began to sweat like great drops of blood that would collect on his eyebrows and on features on his clothing. And it happens when you're under a tremendous amount of stress. And he goes back to the disciples and he says, are you sleeping? He says, couldn't you stay awake with me for just one hour? And he says, wake up, pray with me. And he does this three times. And they fall asleep three times. And these are his closest allies, Peter, James, and John. And yet they couldn't stay up with him. It's about four o'clock in the morning, somewhere between two and four in the morning when all of this is occurring. And then comes Judas with a giant bunch of Romans and people from 
the temple area where they had their own guards. And they all uh, descend upon them at once with torches and clubs and their intent is not good. Judas had a sign with them. It's the one that I go and I kiss. Take him quickly. So Judas walks up to Jesus and he says, Rabbi, and he said, Judas, do you betray the son of man with a kiss? And he kisses him and they go to grab a hold of Jesus and Peter, in an act of courage, pulls his sword. You remember, Jesus told them to take a couple and he slices off an ear. He's probably aiming for a head. Cuts off an ear of the high priest servant and Jesus has to stop all the Romans from killing him. And he says, Peter, put your sword down because if you live by the sword, you're gonna die by the sword. And he picks up this guy's ear and he puts it back on and he heals him. You would think that's enough evidence that they got the wrong guy. But they don't stop. They take him into custody. They put the cuffs on him and they chain him up. And they probably rough him up just so he doesn't think about struggling. And all the disciples flee. Every one leaves him. And Jesus is alone with those who hate him the most. And they really don't have a reason to. Well, Mark brings out something in verses 51 and 52 that you don't see in the other gospels. There was a young man following behind the parade where they were taking Jesus into town somewhere close to four in the morning. And he's got nothing on but a linen sheet. And he's naked underneath. He's one of these guys that likes to get cozy at night, get all of his clothes off. And he's trailing behind and the Romans catch wind that there's somebody tailing them. And so the guys in the back, that's their job, they turn around and they grab hold of this young guy. And it said he's a young man. He's probably a teenager. They grab a hold of him. But like Joseph, they just get a hold of his sheet. And they figure he's not letting go of that. That's all he has. But he does. And the first streaker that ever was. <laughs> this young man runs into the dark without any light, without any knowledge of where he's going. We know who this is historically. It tells us it's John Mark. John Mark, who's the author of this book that we're reading. It's John Mark who follows them at a distance, gets caught, and then he ends up having to lose his sheet, and he runs off. We see in 53 to 65, He's brought to this midnight trial between 4 and 6 a.m. in the morning. He goes between Annas and Caiaphas, and they both are questioning him about how many disciples he has and all of these things and putting it to him. And it's not very elaborated in the book of Mark, but it is in the other Gospels. And they go back and forth. Annas was once the high priest. He kind of steps down, lets his son-in-law take over for a while, and then they switch back and forth so that they always keep power in the family. They question him. It's illegal to have a trial at night according to Jewish law. And yet here between four and six in the morning, they're drilling Jesus about everything with his followers. And so we begin chapter 15, which goes over the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a, consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. You see the Jews have lost all lawful assassination rights. They're not allowed to take a life anymore because they have misused it in the past and the Romans said you're not allowed to do that anymore. We're the occupying force. You have to check with us. So they send him to Pilate They're done with him. They send him away. And then Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? 
And he answered and said to him, it is as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And then Pilate asked him again, saying, do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. See, Pilate was a professional soldier. He knows guilty people begin to sweat when they're accused, when they've done something. Jesus answered nothing at all. He was completely at peace. <coughs> and so he marvels. This guy is not fighting back. We see in Isaiah 53, 7, it's prophesied of Jesus that he was oppressed and afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he opened, opened not his mouth. The same Jesus that says, turn the other cheek, go the second mile, bless those that curse you and curse not. This is the same Jesus doing what he's taught us to do as his followers. Now at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner, speaking of Pilate, and whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, which means son of the father, who was chained with the fellow rebels, and he had committed murder in the rebellion. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them, which is to release someone. But Pilate answered them, saying, do you want me to release the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. You see, Pilate knew what this whole thing was about. This is a soap opera. It's a power play against someone who couldn't even, wouldn't even speak up and defend himself. And so he says, okay, this is my way out. I can get Jesus off. And if you remember, his wife comes to him during all of this and says, have nothing to do with this innocent man. I've been troubled for many times over a dream that I had this morning. So he's been warned. He sees with his eyes. He hears from his wife. He looks and is able to observe this is a sham. And Jesus standing there. And he goes, here's my way out. I know I can release Jesus now because I always release one of them. And certainly they won't want a murderer. Well, he's a murderer no different than the chief priests. They're trying to murder Jesus. And so Barabbas is a real character. And so instead of the father's only begotten son, they choose the son of the father, although he's got a different father. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he would rather release Barabbas to them. So Pilate answered and said to them again, what then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? And so they cried out again, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? It's interesting. He's like a defense attorney now. But they cried out all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them. And he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. He was figuring, if I just beat Jesus bloody enough, maybe they'll have compassion. I mean, he is a Jew like they are. And he says, what would you have me do? And, he's, and they said, crucify. And he says, he's done nothing. And they say back, let his blood be on us and our children. Now that's some serious depravity where you wish your children to bear the brunt of what you're about to do. And yet they shout that out in the book of Luke. Leviticus 16.10 tells us of this practice of releasing one. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. See, Pilate did this because in Leviticus, it talks about before you make a sacrifice on Yom Kippur, on this day of atonement, you take two. And it's a little like what happens to the turkey at Thanksgiving. There's one that gets on a platter and there's one that gets a pardon. 
And it says that the sins of all Israel would fall upon that goat and it would be released. And the man who would release this goat out into the wilderness, they would put something on it in the way of a tie or a bell so that people would know you don't, this goat is not free. This is not like a free McDonald's meal wandering through the wilderness. You don't mess with this goat. It's a religious sacrifice. And that's what Barabbas was. He was the one that got away and Jesus was the one that was sacrificed. And so the Romans are giving a picture of what they found in Leviticus. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called the Praetorium. They called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple. And they twisted a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. And began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. And then they struck him on the head with a reed and they spat on him. By the way, while he was blinded. And bowing the knee and worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off of him, put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. When they were finally done beating Jesus within an inch of his life with what's known as a cat of nine tails. And his skin was peeled off of him to the point where sometimes your internal organs fall out. They decided he'd had enough and they loaded him up with the cross beam of the cross and they said, let's get on with this. He bears a crown of thorns, which is appropriate because he bears the sins of the entire world. Thorns being a representative of that. And off he goes to Calvary. <laughs> this is about nine o'clock in the morning. And then they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. By the way, you might not know this, but being a Cyrenian, you're from Cyrene, which is in Africa. The man asked to carry the cross with Jesus was an African. I'm not sure the whole woke world knows about that. Maybe you want to tell them. And so he gets under the beam with Jesus because Jesus falters and falls under the weight because he's completely exhausted. He's been up all day, all night, been beaten, and is now tasked with following this parade up to Golgotha. So Simon goes with him as there are people on the sides jeering and weeping at the same time. And they brought him to the place of Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. And they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. They tried to anesthetize Jesus so that the pain would be lesser. And he said no. Because he had to bear the full wrath of God, the full cup of God's wrath for you and for me and he didn't lessen it, not one little bit. The place of the skull is called that way because of how it looks. You can see it's shown some wear over the years, but that's what Golgotha means. And so Jesus shows up, and they're ready to put him on the cross. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments. So many birds of prey picking at the carcass, casting lots for them to determine which, what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, by the way, that's, that's nine o'clock in the morning, and they crucified him. And the inscription on his occasion was written above, the king of the Jews. And if you remember, there was a lot of complaining about that from the rabbis and from the priests. And with him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. And so the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. It's actually written in Psalm 22, long before Jesus ever came that the, crust, the Christ would come and he would be numbered with the transgressors, but he would be buried with the rich in his death, which would be 
Joseph of Arimathea, who's coming soon. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Even the thieves on both sides who were guilty of a crime were mocking Jesus when they were suffering the same death. The other gospels give us a conversation between the two where one suddenly gets a heart because he sees Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He sees Jesus conversing. He sees Jesus denying being anesthetized, having the pain lessened. He sees Jesus and he begins to change and he tells his buddy, hey, listen, we deserve what we get, but this guy's an innocent man. Cut it out. And he says to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's what we call faith. He was never baptized. He never went to church. He never sang a hymn. He never read the word. He never did a good deed. He had faith alone. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Deathbed confessions happen. It's bad enough that he's hung on a cross. He's now getting mocked by the people who were standing beneath. He's mocked by his own people. He's mocked by the Jews. He's mocked by everybody who's involved. And there's no one who's not mocking him except for a handful of women. And then the sixth hour had come. And there was darkness over the whole land till the ninth hour. By the way, that's from 12 noon to three in the afternoon when the sun is at its brightest. And the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by, when they heard that, they said, look, he's calling Elijah. Because apparently they have no idea what he's saying. And then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. They did this because they thought maybe they didn't understand him. They wanted him to clear his tongue so they could hear what he was saying. His final last words. How morbid is that? And they were saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and take him. These people have no idea what he's saying. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice. And we know what he said. He said, it is finished. To telestai, which means the debt is paid in full. And he breathed his last and he died on the cross. Long before they had to come and break his legs, he willingly gave up his life. I don't think he could have held on a second longer. And he did it for you and me. Amen. Psalm 22 is referring to what Jesus spoke on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? which is what Jesus said on the cross, pointing people who would listen to Psalm 22. Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Verse six, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out their lip and they shake their head. He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. He says in verse 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax 
it has melted within me. This is a first person testimony of Jesus dying on the cross long before he ever came. My heart is melting within me, actually drowned from hanging on a cross because all of your bodily fluids begin to fill the cavities of your lungs and you have to press up on your feet so that you can get a gasp of air. And Jesus finally gave up and he let go and Jesus dies. And then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from afar among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the less and of Joseph and Salome who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. There's no one there except the women because all of the men were threatened to be there. The only man that stands at the foot is John the apostle, who's probably somewhere between 15 and 16 years old because he's not a threat. <coughs> and Jesus gives his mom to John. He says, behold your mother. And he says to Mary, behold your son. He's giving her into the care of a teenager because all of his younger brothers and sisters were not responsible enough to do so because Mary was a follower and they were not. So these are the witnesses, the veil, the centurion, and the women. Now, when the evening had come, because it was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, he came and took courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. He didn't want any tricks. So he found out from the centurion and he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph, putting everything on the line, risking his reputation, risking his ability to even take of the Passover because he's about to mess with a dead body, something you don't do if you're going to go to Passover because you defile yourself. And then you have to change your clothes, wash, and you have to be put outside the camp for a period of time, at least overnight, before you could be coming in. Joseph of Arimathea comes and does this and risks everything in the face of the chief priests and all of his friends. He comes to claim the body of Jesus. And he's not alone because he brings Nicodemus, who's another prominent teacher who Jesus shares chapter three in the book of John that he has to be born again. So we see these undercover brothers that come out of the woodwork and they take courage at this time and they risk everything to come and get the body of Jesus when no one else would come. They didn't have nice golf carts or limousines and they just carried his body. The tomb was not far from where he was crucified. And then he brought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. You see, the women followed his body. Joseph was taking him to his family tomb, which was carved out of solid rock, guys with hammers and chisels, a very expensive deal. And they're going to lay him out and put him on a horizontal platform made of stone. There were several inside. What they would do is years later come back and collect the remains and put it in an ossuary, which is a, a large vase. And then they would put the next person who would die 
on the slab until they were deteriorated. But they rolled the stone in front of the tomb and the priests went to Pilate and said, you better secure that thing really, really well because his disciples have been talking about resurrection. Jesus, when he was alive, said that he would be raised in three days. So if you don't stop this, you're gonna have a movement on your hands. And so he said, well, take a guard and go and secure it as well as you can. And you know that they sealed that thing up as good as possible and they stationed guards, about 16 of them, which would swap hours so they could all stay awake to make sure they guarded the tomb where Jesus was buried. It's one of those unusual things that they give military people to do, guard a tomb. But in this case, it wasn't so unusual. That's the story of the death of Jesus Christ on a day we now call Good Friday. Although up to this point, no one involved would call it a Good Friday. No one knew the full extent of what was about to happen, but you do. And you know that Sunday's coming. I want to run to Sunday because Sunday is full of hope. I don't want to linger on Good Friday because I think about the cost of my sin. I was born to two sinful parents. I have sinful proclivities. I still have weakness. And Jesus came to die for my shame. He took my shame away. He took the power of that sin in my life away so that I'm no longer a slave to it. That's the beauty of Good Friday. That's why Friday is so good. is because Jesus came and died for the sins of the world if you have not confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, if you have not grabbed hold of that for which he died for, you can do that today. If you don't know him, you can. It's by simply asking. God, I know I'm a sinner, and I need you to save me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you were the son of God, that you came to die for my sins. I pray you apply that to my life. Free me from my shame and from my sin. And I will live for you. Come into me and fill me with your Holy Spirit and adopt me as your child. In Jesus' name. And it's that simple. And God begins a work in you that can never be undone and you'll never be able to run away from or live it down or wear it out. Amen? Amen. Father God, thank you so much for your love for us, which was demonstrated by the death of your son. Thank you so much, Lord, that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to become good enough. He didn't wait for us to work ourselves into a place of worthy redemption. But Lord, you saved us so that you might work us into some form of worthiness. Lord Jesus, I pray that this season would be a change for every one of us. That we might receive again into our hearts the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we might have a real life that you purchased with your very blood. Help us, Lord Jesus, to have joy because, my goodness, we have a reason for joy. And help us to remember the cost. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.